Welcome to Stagecoach, where you'll find the best Western books on the market and the men and women who write them. This podcast is brought to you by Dusty Saddles Publishing, home of the best-selling authors in the Western genre. This is your host, Ginger Winters. Join us on the Stagecoach as we take a ride back in time to the Old West with The Bone Scraper, Book One, The Atlanta Load, by Zachary Craig Hansen, read by Justin King. The Bone Scraper, Book One, The Atlanta Load, by Zachary Craig Hansen. Prologue. An eerie feeling hung in the early morning air as Walter walked through the streets of his small mountain village in the still wild Idaho territory. Thanks to the fresh snow, the silence was cutting, only broken by the occasional sound of a distant horse whinnying or the errant and hair-raising cry of a wolf on a far-off ridgeline. It was Christmas Eve, and he was making his way toward the single-room white church that had been built just over a month ago, a stone's throw from the whorehouse of Slippery Gulch. Walter Frank was the foreman of the Lenora Mine, and a prototypical miner who helped found the town. He was a husband and father who dealt punishment to his family through a regular drunken haze, and that violence at home often spilled out into the broader community. Despite the regular abuse towards his family, Walter was brought up in the church back east and carried a latent feeling of guilt with him wherever he went. When he remained sober too long and could no longer suppress that guilt, he sought forgiveness from whatever godly authority he could find. As he pushed open the church's heavy door, the acrid smell of burning pine met Walter's nose. Jesse Waite, the town's preacher, shoved in one last scoop of pine, slowly shutting the door to the wood stove and rose to meet the man entering his dominion at the odd early morning hour. Walter, what a pleasant surprise, Jesse said, without a single tinge of sarcasm. What brings you into the house of the Lord this early in the morning? The color began to drain from Walter's face, and his voice cracked as he started to speak. I have a confession to make, Walter stuttered. Something that has to be held in confidence with just you, me, and the Lord. Something I can't go on living with. As a church leader, Jesse was bound to the confidentiality of his congregation, and without hesitation, he motioned for Walter to join him in the sanctuary. Jesse guided his unexpected guest to the front pew of his newly built worship hall. Then, taking a seat in the pew behind Walter, Jesse touched the foreman's shoulder to let him know that he was ready for him to confess. The worship room was small. It had no insulation in the walls, and the new windows did little to keep out the cold. But at that moment, the cold didn't matter to Walter. Whether it was the numbness of his most recent act of hatred, or the remnants of a near-omnipresent hangover, he didn't feel anything. Yet, as he felt the touch of Jesse's hand on his shoulder, the story of the previous night's encounter spewed out like vomit. Throughout muted tears and half-hearted sobs, Walter told the story of getting liquored up like any other night, at the local brewery. Early in the evening, Walter had a chance run-in with one of the many Chinese laborers' daughters who happened to be walking by outside the bar at the worst possible moment. That night, Walter lit a cigarette, and with a whiskey-induced sense of self-assurance, he made a pass at the 15-year-old girl, spouting some brazen line about how she needed a real man to make her a woman. His hubris was not seated in reality, of course. Although they looked down on the Chinese laborers as if they were second-class citizens, Walter and his mining buddies were not a well-kept bunch. The young girl's name was Lynn. As expected, she nervously lowered her head and tried to ignore her accoster's physical advance, his bad breath, and his body odor by speeding up her cadence. Perturbed, Walter reached out to grab her arm, spinning her petite body toward him, and with no forethought of the repercussions her action may hold, Lynn spat right in the man's face. In disgust, Walter pushed her away, spewed a few racial slurs, and made his way back into the bar to do what he did best, drink and feel sorry for himself. As Walter sat brooding on a bar stool, the anger and rejection swelled in his already callous soul. He knew the girl would be walking by the bar again within the next hour, and he allowed the next few shots of liquor to give him enough confidence to wait a few blocks down from the bar to confront his denier. 
Lying in wait in the darkness of that cold December evening, Walter played out what he would do once he got his hands on Lynn. He would berate her and dress her down so that she knew she was below him. He would teach her that she should never deny a white man in that manner. But when Lynn walked by again, that's not what transpired. When Lynn approached the alley where Walter hid, she was not expecting the dirty bare paw of a hand that quickly covered her mouth and dragged her into the darkness of the alley. His hand never leaving her mouth, Walter threw her onto the snowbank and fell on top of her in a drunken stupor. Shocked, Lynn locked eyes with her abuser and recognized him as the man she had spat on earlier in the evening. The fear in her eyes grew as the positioning of their bodies triggered an innate sense of aggression in Walter. He began to grope her. Unable to push her assailant off, Lynn sunk her slightly crooked teeth into the hand that still covered her face. The shot of adrenaline the bite sent through Walter's body briefly stunted the drunken fog and replaced it with something more dangerous, blind rage. Walter reared back his bitten hand, and before Lynn could make a peep, he brought his fist down hard on her small skull repeatedly until she no longer moved. Thinking she was merely unconscious, Walter proceeded to rape the young girl in that dark, snow-covered alley before pulling up his pants, bemoaning his bruised hand, and sauntering home to a wife and kids who hated him. The small town only knew Jesse Waite as a traveling preacher who had shown up during the previous summer. He carried the quiet resolve of a man who had likely seen action during the war between the states, but to most he seemed sad, like a man burdened by a troubled past or weighed down by the sins of his congregation. That quiet resolve never seemed to waver as he was never seen drinking or socializing with the wider populace of the 500-person mining town that he and Walter both called home. Yet, as Walter recounted his terrible actions in confidence, Jesse's mind began to wander. Since moving to the small town of Atlanta, Idaho, Jesse had befriended many of the Chinese laborers that most of the whites tended to ignore. One of those close friends just so happened to be Ko Lam. Ko was a town's bone scraper and proprietor of the apothecary on Main Street. He had given Jesse his first job when he arrived in Atlanta. Kim also happened to have a beautiful and lively daughter named Lynn. As Jesse's pious mind made the connection, as he realized he had his hand on the shoulder of the rapist and murderer of his friend's daughter, he felt a guttural rage growing inside of him, something he had not felt since leaving the southern battlefields where so many of his friends and brothers had died. With one hand still on Walter's shoulder, Jesse's left hand slowly reached for the loose piano wire that lay on the pew next to him. It was the same wire he had been using to retune the busted piano that stood just a few feet away. While Walter was in mid-sentence, grossly describing the suppleness of his young victim's body, in a way that seemed more boastful than remorseful, Jesse silently slipped the piano wire around Walter's pudgy neck, and as Walter turned toward the preacher at the sensation of the cold wire hitting his skin, Jesse slammed his right foot onto the back of the pew and started to pull as hard as he could. The wire cut swiftly through the thick layers of fat in Walter's neck as his rotund and mining-hardened body began to writhe. Fearing that his grip would slip, Jesse put his other foot up on the pew to gain more leverage, and he pulled and pulled until sweat began to pool on his brow. As the wire dug deeper and severed the carotid arteries and trachea, Jesse could hear the air leaving Walter's lungs. The only indication Jesse had to let up on his grip was the feeling of the wire striking the vertebrae at the back of Walter's neck. Releasing the tension on the wire, the next thing Jesse felt was the wetness on his own pants as he looked down at the blood dripping onto him from Walter's severed neck. Stoically, Jesse got up to look into the strained, scared, and bloodshot eyes of Walter Frank's nearly decapitated head. Looking down into those unremorseful eyes, Jesse couldn't help but smile. A sense of retribution, justice, and thrill of the kill showered over him as he said a silent prayer to the god he had dedicated his life to. Part 1 Spark Chapter 1 Rocky Bar Altoris County, Idaho, July 1867 The dew was heavy on the saddle as Jesse Waite pulled himself onto his horse for the final seven-mile push into the thriving gold town of Rocky Bar. That town had been his destination ever since he got a letter from his youngest brother Irwin when the war ended a little over two years ago. Irwin, much to his brother's disgrace, had deserted the Confederate Army in 1863 to head west, 
away from the war and toward a rich future, mining the gold low to the Idaho Territory. In a letter to Jesse, Irwin claimed that his desertion was noble and that looking for gold would be crucial to help the war effort for the seceded states. Jesse knew better, though. His brother had a cowardly streak that would show itself during stressful times, an affliction he seemed to have had since childhood. No matter. Once the war was over, Jesse needed somewhere to go, and Irwin was the only family he had left. His two older brothers had been killed in various campaigns, and the grief of that loss had struck down his aging mother in the waning months of the war. With no family left back east, Jesse had chosen to go westward and find his last remaining kin. Yet, as he started to crest the final hill in the long dirt road into the bustling town of Rocky Bar, Jesse felt a growing excitement. He was eager to connect with his only surviving brother and to tell him of the new path in life he had chosen on the battlefields of war, to be an emissary for the Lord. Knowing his brother's penchant for booze and loose women, Jesse rode his horse up to the one place he would not normally visit, the town bar. Avoiding eye contact with grizzled and dirty mountain men and ignoring the cat calls from the pungent-smelling whorehouse ladies, Jesse dismounted his horse. Then, using a manger tie, he hitched him to the lone post outside the watering hole, just as he had done throughout the war, when he felt he may need to get out of trouble fast. The chatter emanating from inside the bar made Jesse pause to collect his thoughts, before entering through the thin and tall doors. Jesse hated crowds, and had felt most comfortable on his long and most singular journey to the Idaho Territory a feeling he coveted ever since he crossed through the dangerous Indian nation, crawling with Comanche, Crow, and Shoshone peoples. The accumulation of months of silence and introspection made him dread the thought of being around groups of loud and intoxicated people. With a deep breath, he entered the raucous establishment, brimming with drunkards, though it could be no later than 10 a.m. Pushing through the collective of ruffians, he caught elbows with no less than three men with revolvers hanging at their sides. The new face caught them all off guard, and as Jesse moved past them with purpose, he could feel their extended gaze piercing the back of his skull. Once at the bar, Jesse did his best to get the attention of the barkeep, a plain yet attractive middle-aged woman who he would learn went by the name of Annie. After purposely ignoring the new face for what seemed like hours to Jesse, Annie finally slammed down a whiskey in front of him, the one staple in the establishment. With an outstretched hand, Jesse made the mistake of waving off the drink. Uh, no, I don't, I don't drink, Jesse said, louder than he should have. In that moment, all eyes within earshot turned to Jesse with a curious tinge that had an undertone of kinetic violence. What the hell do you mean you don't drink? Annie barked. This is a goddamn bar. If it's a lady you fancy, you can head next door. By the looks of you, you may well could use one. No, you see, I'm looking for my brother. Jesse said over the hushed voices nearby. He sent me a letter a while back. Do you know him? Irwin White. Sucking her few good teeth and looking toward the ceiling. Annie's demeanor changed. She reached out a calloused hand and laid it on top of Jesse's on the bar, sending a chill down his spine. He had forgotten what the touch of a woman felt like. Annie waved over a young woman at the other end of the bar, motioning for her to see to Annie's duties while she stepped away. She shifted her gaze back to Jesse then. Come on back behind the bar, she said. Opening a small door, Annie ushered Jesse into a back room lined with liquor bottles and salted meats. As she turned her back to Jesse, he caught a glimpse of something below the seam of her floor-length dress. Annie had a wooden leg. She walked with an exaggerated sway, followed by the loud clacking of her prosthetic against the wooden floor. Jesse hadn't seen an amputee since he had left the war. He had certainly never met a woman who had suffered the same fate as so many of the young men he had fought with. Leaving him no time to ask questions, Annie sharply turned around, putting her back to the sea of whiskey bottles. Listen, you must be Jesse. Your brother, Irwin, well, was a man that struggled to make and maintain friendships, Annie said with a deadpan look. About a month ago, he went on a solo trip up and over the James Creek Pass to the town of Atlanta, to see if he could have more luck place in mining for gold over there. She continued. Turns out he was even worse than making friends in that hellhole. He got himself shot at the Chinese gambling house over a stupid fucking card game. <laughs> a bunch of heathens, I tell you. Jesse stared blankly at the bottles of liquor behind Annie as the ringing in his ears began to intensify, just as they had done in the battlefields during the war, and a near-constant experience in times of stress. 
the numbness he felt knowing that his last surviving brother and family member was dead devastated him. Of course he would get himself shot, he thought. Come on, Annie said. Let's get you across the street to the hotel to rest and clean up. She took him by the wrist and led him through the doors, once more into a sea of drunkards. On the way out, Jesse's body again made contact with one of the patrons, who had been peeved by his special treatment and drink refusal. And in an act of bravado, the man pulled out his pistol, grabbing Jesse by his waist. He shoved the barrel of his gun right under Jesse's hairy chin. The eyes that the drunkard saw staring back at him sobered him up immediately. The eyes of a rabid dog, of a man with nothing to lose, an apparent wish for death. The man struggled to free his pistol from Jesse's grip, and it was only the gentle touch of Annie that broke Jesse from his glare. Uncocking and putting his pistol back into its holster, the bar patron turned around to laugh off the incident and let his nerves cool down as he watched Annie frisk the feral outsider out of the bar and into the early morning sun. Chapter 2 Battle for Antietam Maryland, September 1862 The early fall moon cast a glow over the sea of dead men that littered the battlefield. The fight surrounding General Lee's campaign into Maryland had lasted two days, and there seemed to be no clear victor, save for the Grim Reaper who was still working at ferrying bodies over to Valhalla. It was through the mass of dead bodies, bloated, covered in dirt, blood, and feces, that Jesse Waite was crawling. Most men brave enough to willingly put themselves back into that macabre scene that few had survived were looking for men wearing the same color jackets as they were, with hopes to find and bury their brothers, friends, and fathers. Jesse was not. A member of Jenkins' South Carolina Brigade, Jesse had seen fighting on behalf of the seceded states since the beginning of the war. Seeing action at both battles of Bull Run and at the gruesome clashes of Seven Pines, Jesse had been indoctrinated in the ways of the battle and had witnessed death in many ways that no man should. As the war raged on, Jesse found that he had a penchant for killing men. Sometimes that came from a place of survival, not pleasure. Prior to the war, Jesse had only ever killed game animals to help feed his brothers and mother in rural South Carolina. He had spent his days tending to the fields or in his local church, learning about the life of Jesus Christ. However, crawling through a maze of dead and dying men, Jesse could not feel the presence of the entity he had prayed to his whole life. Slithering over bodies, he could feel the blood of his brethren soaking through his cotton clothes, and the weight of his own body would often force air and gas out of the cadavers that made him flinch, cringe, and gag. Out there on the battlefield, he was searching for someone and after an hour of putrid crawling, Jesse found his mark. About halfway up a pine-covered knoll lay the body of a Union soldier, face down in a pool of drying blood, his body contorted. As Jesse got closer, his adrenaline took over. Less than 24 hours ago, this knoll had seen a Union advance on Confederate lines, lines that Jesse and his Southern regiment were desperately trying to defend. Wave after wave of Union soldiers kept pouring in, outnumbering the Southerners two to one in what seemed like a never-ending stream. Eventually, every rifle cartridge was emptied, and both sides tore into one another in fever of hand-to-hand -hand combat that not all men were prepared for. Through the haze and constant ringing in Jesse's ears, he watched as Union soldiers tore down his friends and brothers with swords, bayonets, and fists all around him. This ignited a rage in Jesse that he had not felt in other battles, which were mostly delegated to define skirmish lines, that played more to luck than want and need to kill fellow countrymen with bare hands. His melee of thought ceased when Jesse looked in front of him to see a body coming directly at him, knife in hand. With a growl, Jesse dunked on in the arm of the advancing soldier and easily took him down to the ground, planting the man right on his rear end. The blow of Jesse's shoulder into the man's stomach had taken the fight right out of him, and the soldier turned on his stomach as if he were going to crawl away. Jesse felt an immense sense of power over this Union soldier, and was surprised at the ease with which he was able to overpower him. As the soldier reared his head back in a flailing attempt to get away, Jesse spotted a small rock protruding from the ground about a foot away from where they wrestled. Like the grizzly bear that had mauled the famed mountain man, 
Hugh Glass. Jesse sunk his claws into his victim and lifted him, moving the soldier a foot or so closer to the rock with minimal effort. Jesse pressed both of his knees into the back of the soldier, hearing ribs crack as he dug his fingers into the overgrown and matted hair of the enemy. With a glaze of unknown hatred, Jesse lifted the soldier's head up and caught a quick glimpse of the young man's face before driving it down hard onto the rock that lay under his chin. Again and again between muffled screams and grunts, Jesse lifted the soldier's head and smashed it harder and harder onto the rock. Hearing the crack of more bones and feeling the ooze of blood and brain matter accumulating below him. It wasn't until he felt pain in his own knuckles, slamming into the rock itself, that he stopped. Rolling over, he lay next to the twitching body of the man he had just killed, and he started to play back the visions of the face he had seen no less than a minute before. Breathing heavily, he could swear he had just seen and killed his younger 15 year old brother, Bart. As he lay there in the fog of war, with men, bullets, and cavalry buzzing around him. It took several minutes before his training kicked in, and he arose once again to continue the fight. Within the next hour, the battle started to wane, and each side began to recede to their lower water mark, just as the tide had always done in his youth growing up in coastal South Carolina. That evening, as both sides were tending to their dead and wounded, Jesse could not shake the thought of the young man he had killed. He knew that his brother could have joined the war by now, but he would have never joined the Union Army to fight against his own family, would he? Shocked by the violence of the day, exhausted, and unsure of where his regiment would be sent next, Jesse couldn't bear the thought of not confirming whether his brother had been on that very battlefield and come hand-to-hand -hand with his older brother. As Jesse made his way to the body of the prone soldier under a bright moon, he could feel a primal fear take over. The body lying there looked just like that of his brother, skinny, tall, and with a thick mane of dirty blonde hair. When Jesse mustered the nerve to flip the body over, he was immediately drawn to retching. As the bile of his near-empty stomach mixed with the partially dried brain matter of his victim, Jesse began to weep. There was nothing left. Jesse had fought so hard and so ruthlessly that he had bashed away every identifiable piece of this young man's skull. All that remained were bone fragments, teeth, and a bit of hair on the back of the skull that looked like a scalp taken by an Indian out west. With a shaking hand, Jesse reached into the boy's coat pocket to sift through his belongings to try and identify who he was. Pulling out hardtack, wet powder and ball, and an unset lender spotted with blood, Jesse strained his eyes to read. Dearest Mother, We are well on our way to defend the great state of Maryland from the southern pestilence. I will likely not be writing to you for some time as we are being encouraged by our leaders to make advancements, while luck is in our favor. This will be a great surprise to the South, and a wonderful gift to myself on my upcoming birthday, my sixteenth year. Give my sister all of my love, and I will write you soon. Your son, Thomas. Jesse's tears met the blood on the paper, and once again reactivated their dominance over the words. Both relief and sorrow washed over him. Relief that this was not his brother, and sorrow that he had slain an innocent boy. Recalling the events of the interaction, Jesse began to weep as he curled up next to this boy in a fetal position, a broken and hollow shell of the man he had once been. Lying there clutching the letter, Jesse looked at the waxing moon through his tear-filled eyes and talked to God. He prayed for forgiveness, for guidance, but moreover, he prayed openly that if he were to see him through this war, he would dedicate his life to the Lord's cause and never needlessly kill another innocent man again. Chapter 3 Alturas Hotel Rocky Bar, Idaho July 1867 when Peg Leg Annie escorted Jesse out of the bar, she led him across the street to the town's sole boarding house. It turns out Annie was the proprietor of several establishments in town, including the bar, the Altoris Hotel, and a whorehouse, an impressive and rare accomplishment among frontier women, which spoke to the gritty and entrepreneurial spirit that she imbued. Getting him settled, she ordered Jesse a bath that was drawn around noon. Despite the hot July day, 
Jesse was eager to clean up after so many months on the road and excitedly stripped down once the bath attendant finally left the room. Completely nude, Jesse caught a glimpse of himself in the fractured mirror that stood opposite of the tub. It was the first time he had seen himself in months, and he was surprised at how skinny he had become on his westward journey. Not since the war ended could he count his ribs without needing to squint his eyes. Taking in his own image, he saw the dark, dirt-colored skin that would soon wash away and then touched the small scar that adorned his right lip. As he touched the scar, he remembered the searing pain that accompanied the round ball as it ripped through his side and exited cleanly between his ribs and pelvis, a lucky wound that only caused him a slight limp. Batting his eyes a few times, he brought himself out of his torrent of memories as he stepped into the bath. The warmth that engulfed him in that moment felt like a womb, and he allowed himself, if only for a moment, to relax. He thought about his brothers, his mother, and his wife and unborn child. All gone from this earth too soon. He thought about the men he had killed in war, and the promise he'd made to God five years earlier, on the Antietam battlefield, to serve the Lord and avoid unwarranted killing. As the steam from the water started to accumulate like dew on his face, he submerged his entire body underwater and held himself there. At the bottom of the tub, he opened his eyes but could only make out the faint daylight through the dirty, off-color water. He thought about what lay in store for him out west. As his body finally begged him for oxygen, he relented and resurfaced as if he had just been baptized. At that moment, he knew where he had to go. He would venture to the town where his last living relative was buried, a short 19 miles away, and look for a sign. It was time to make good on the promise he had made on that Antietam battlefield. He was going to Atlanta to become a soldier for God. Chapter 4 Rocky Bar Altores County, Idaho, July 1867 When Jesse emerged from the boarding house after getting some much-needed rest, he was wholly unrecognizable. The rough, trail-hardened exterior had been washed away, and his now clean-shaven face gave way to boyish features that were only hardened by the few scars he carried. He set out from the hotel to find the woman with the wooden leg whose name he could barely remember. Annie? Angie? Anne? He hoped to get intel on how best to find a guide to get him over the steep pass and into the now bustling mining town of Atlanta. Being close to 8 p.m., the bar was once again at max capacity. Only now there were bodies littering the streets, crumpled, drunken heaps of those who had succumbed to the power of the local whiskey. Stepping over a few of them, Jesse again made his way through the tall entry doors and into the gauntlet. Yet it surprised him how easily he made it to the bar this time. No elbows, no confrontation, just quick glances. His bath and grooming must have made him a much less menacing figure in the eyes of the roughnecks. When Jesse made it to the bar, Annie was kind enough to give him a whiskey glass filled with water to blend into the drinking crowd, and then asked him how his stay was. It was great, said Jesse. I guess I needed that shave and rest. Yeah, yeah, you sure as shit did. Think half the bar smelled you before you limped your sour ass through those doors, Annie said. Thankfully, between your stench and that thousand-yard stare of yours, you warded off an introductory ass-kicking. Or worse. She paused and looked at him up and down, smiled and touched his hands. I gotta admit, you're way better looking than that brother of yours. She said with a wink, once again sucking at her few good teeth. Especially after a proper wash-up. Feeling a bit uncomfortable, Jessie thanked Annie for her hospitality and asked if she knew anyone heading over to Atlanta that may be willing to guide him. Leaving so soon? What a shame. But if you're dead set on getting over to that hellhole of a town, there is a fella named Eustace that runs pack mules to take mail and supplies over the hill every so often, Annie said. I'll tell you where his cabin is, and you can go hunt him down tomorrow. After Annie relayed how to get to Eustace's place, Jesse chugged the water in a fashion that looked like he was shooting whiskey, slammed his glass down, and made his way to the boarding house to get a full night's rest. Chapter 5 Eustace Stevens' Cabin Rocky Bar, Idaho, July of 1867 The next day, following Annie's directions, 
Jesse rode up to a small hand-hewn cabin that had seven beaver pelts hung on rings, drying in the morning sun. Along the eastern-facing wall of the shack were tons of boarded coyote skins and a large mule deer pelt, strung up between reeds like the natives of Idaho would do. And there stood an elderly, bald, and hunchback man, shirtless, tanned, and sporting a long gray beard. He was actively scraping the mule deer pelt of any remaining fat. At the sound of the approaching hooves of Jesse's horse, the mountain man's ears perked up, but he never left the business of scraping the hide in front of him. Clearly not threatened by the wire-thin and clean-shaven man approaching, he continued to act as if there were no one in his vicinity. Excuse me, Eustace, Jesse said in a low and serious tone. Annie told me you may be leading a pack train over to Atlanta soon. I was wondering if I could tag along. Never breaking his concentration, Eustace kept going about his business, ignoring the stranger. Growing impatient, Jesse dismounted his horse and worked his way over to the man. Wondering if he may be deaf, as he got within arm's reach, he felt the hand of Eustace smack him in the chest with an audible thud. In that hand, Eustace had a scraping knife. Instinctually, Jesse knew that Eustace was asking him to help out. So he took the knife and began scraping the long deer hide in the same long stroke fashion that Eustace did. So what in the hell are you doing out in these parts, city boy? Eustace finally broke his silence without ever lifting his eyes to meet the stranger. Well, I came to meet my brother, Jesse said. But it turns out he's already six feet under and buried somewhere over in Atlanta. <clears throat> Sounds like a real tragedy, Eustace replied. Yes, and I was hoping I could tag along with you and your pack train to go over and see him one last time, Jesse said. He got quiet for a moment then. Or his grave, anyways. Still not meeting his eyes with Jesse. Eustace laid down his knife and started an awkward waddle toward the entrance of his cabin, and with a single stern grunt, he motioned for Jesse to follow him. Following Eustace, Jesse had to duck to make it through the low door and into the dank room that felt like a hobbit's lair. All along the walls were animals in various states of undress, and fur in different stages of being tanned. This piqued Jesse's interest as he had never learned the art of turning animal fur into clothing, and had, to his chagrin, been dependent on his mother, town clothiers, and in the military for his everyday wear. Eustace made his way to the far corner of a surprisingly frigid cabin and picked up some salted and drying meat. He waddled his way back to Jesse and threw him a piece of jerky, while simultaneously taking a gnawing bite out of one himself. Eustace sat cross-legged on the large cinnamon-colored bear rug that covered his clapboard floor and motioned for Jesse to join him. Atlanta, huh? said Eustace. Don't get me wrong. I get the sense you can handle yourself. But how long have you been out here in the Rockies? This here's a different place in the back east. These animals out here will eat you alive if they get a chance. And the humans here ain't much better. Jesse listened intently and thought about how to answer. But he was distracted by the beautiful Hawkins 50 caliber rifle that hung above Eustace's makeshift mantle. Yep, that there gun's got me out of... And into many a scrape over the years, said Eustace then, noticing where Jesse had fixed his gaze. I've been out here since 50, after the gold rush in California started to cool. Hell, I was probably the same age you is now, Eustace noted. Speaking of guns, how you plan on feeding yourself? You know how to hunt or trap? Jesse nodded in the affirmative, but quickly followed up by saying that he knew how to hunt and carried a small caliber rifle. But trapping was new to him. Grinning from ear to ear, Eustace hopped up from his seated position and took Jesse by the arm with an almost childlike glee. He dragged him to a corner where he kept all of his trapping supplies, lures, and piles of fur, and he led Jesse through an impromptu course in trapping, something Jesse was not expecting but welcomed. After an hour of letting Eustace bend his ear, Jesse finally worked up the courage to ask the same question he had when he had first dismounted his horse. Listen, Eustace, I appreciate the hospitality, but I do want to know if you plan to head to Atlanta anytime soon. Jesse's question knocked the smile right off of Eustace's face. Still want to go to Atlanta, huh? <laughs> yeah, I was hoping you dropped that idea. Well, I gotta run mail and supplies over to Mining Corporation in two days, Eustace said. 
I'm going to go there early because I run trap lines the whole length of the trip. I tell you what. You help me run my lines and I'll be your guide. I'll leave a first light tomorrow. Jesse stood up immediately to shake Eustace's hand and headed right for the door. Hey, mister! Eustace has hollered as Jesse crossed the threshold back into the sunlight. What do you plan to do once you get over to that cesspool sin? With half of his face shadowed by the cabin and the other half lit by the morning sun, Jesse stared at Eustace. Whatever the Lord wants me to do, he said. Maybe I'll start a church. Eustace broke the seriousness of the moment with a deep guttural chuckle. Ha <laughs> ha! Hell, son, they sure could use one of those. With that, Eustace shot up and pushed past Jesse, beating him outside where he once again picked up a scraping knife and got back to work on the deer hide. First light, Jesse! Eustace yelled out in finality as Jesse hopped up in his saddle and pointed south, back in the direction of Rocky Bar. Chapter 6 James Creek Pass Altoris County, Idaho, July 1867 Jesse's second night in the boarding house was not as restful as his first. No longer exhausted, his mind raced all night, and he found the horsehair mattress no longer lulled him into a deep sleep. After fighting his mind for hours, he relented to his thoughts, silently got dressed, and went to saddle up his horse around 3 a.m. In the pre-dawn morning of Rocky Bar, everything was quiet, which was in stark contrast to how the small town ran 90% of the time. Jesse loved the mornings when no one else seemed to be awake. It reminded him of times when his fellow soldiers would be fast asleep in their tents during the war. Unable to sleep then too, he would crawl out of his bivy and work his way towards the wood line for some solace. With only the faint sounds of men snoring, he would sit and attempt to process everything he had been through. Even now, as he sat silently at yet another wood line, waiting for Eustace to start stirring in his cabin, he found himself working through his trauma by way of silent prayer and deep thought. Jesse's creative brain couldn't help but replay scenarios from the war, sometime with different outcomes. What if I had let that boy go? Would he have killed me? Of course it would have. It only took minutes for Jesse to get lost in the silence of the woods while he wrestled with his manic thoughts. The intensity of his medications was only shaken loose by a distinctive whistle coming from the woods behind him, which instantly freed him from his thickening mental cobwebs. Hey! At least you're punctual there, but not punctual enough. <laughs> if I'd been an engine, bandit, or cougar, you'd be dead. Eustace said with a haughty chuckle as he led a team of five mules out of the woods and towards Jesse. Where, where did you come from? Jesse asked, embarrassed. Back in mules ain't easy, Eustace answered. I've been up since the sun went down, collecting mail, packing food, cinching down leather. <laughs> but by the grace of the man you serve, you are here, and I don't have to leave you. Lucky you. As Eustace led his pack train around Jesse, Jesse couldn't help but notice in the bright summer moonlight that the last two mules in the train were weighed down with something he had never seen before. Say, Eustace, what are all these small twine pieces hanging out of these mule packs? Looks like they're all connected to small tubes. Ah, that there's dynamite. The mining corps used it to blast through rock to open their mines. Pretty dangerous stuff, said Eustace. Listen, Jesse, you keep an eye out on those two mules. They're known for trouble. If you see him roll up a cigarette, you let me know. Can't have him blowing us up on the trail. <laughs> Eustace chuckled then, more amused by his own joke than Jesse was. As Jesse, Eustace, and the mule started to weave through the thick ponderosa pines and headed north toward the steep pass of James Creek, an excitement washed over Jesse. Because despite the circumstances he found himself in, he was once again on the move. Something he had grown accustomed to in his life. It brought him an eerie sense of comfort. Jesse was used to the mountains. He had fought in campaigns all across the Blue Ridge lands of the south and was used to the complications of getting horse and man up steep cliffs. But this was different. Within a mile of Eustace's cabin, he could feel himself leaning forward in his saddle so much that his belly button frequently hit the saddle horn. The steep pitch was also doing a number on his horse. He found he had to stop to let his steed breathe and cool down more often than he was used to. He thought this was a bit ironic as Eustace and the mule seemed to have no issues plucking right along. 
This led to a chain reaction where Jesse kept having to play catch-up to keep up with Eustace after each short stop he made. Closer to five miles into their journey, the sun began to rise, though it was not visible over the 10,000-foot peak of Bald Mountain directly in front of them. Its ambient light poured into the valley around them and set a gray tone to every tree. As the forest came alive with the sound of birds, squirrels, and other moving animals, Jesse found himself once again catching up to Eustace, only this time they were stopped, and Eustace was rummaging through one of the packs of his lead mule. All right, come on now, it's time to get set up our first trap. Eustace said as he pulled out a double spring foothold trap, then with a decent length of chain attached to it. Jesse knew what Eustace was holding thanks to the impromptu lesson he received the day prior, and quickly dismounted his horse and found a tree to hitch him to. He worked his way up toward the front of the train where Eustace was standing, and was greeted with a leather pouch being thrown at him. Take this. What Eustace had tossed him was a sack full of beaver castorium oil that he had harvested from previous catches. That stuff drives them beavers wild, he said. Throw a little bit around a broken dam and you'll for sure get some to come investigate. Trap in hand, Eustace turned swiftly and hucked himself over the steep embankment of the road and toward the stream below. Jesse turned to follow but was struck down by a memory of his father teaching him the hunt in a similar manner when he was just ten years old. His father used to take him and his brothers into the woods like this, with little to no instruction other than to stay close and pay attention. That memory slipped away as soon as Jesse's footing went loose in the dirt and he found himself sliding down the hill towards Eustace. With a thud, he landed at the bottom of the embankment. He was able to brace himself just enough on a small sapling to keep vertical, but not before he got a disapproving stare from Eustace at the side of the creek. Listen, preacher man, these woods ain't no joke. Piece of advice? Take your time. Broke leg out here is a death sentence. Jesse shamefully nodded, just as he had done in his youth, quietly following his father. It's a shame, preacher man, Eustace said as he turned to face the creek. The original mountain men of the 30s damn near trapped out every beaver from here to the coast. Thankfully, they must have missed some. They're starting to come back. He fell silent for a moment and continued. I've been watching this here lodge for a while, and these little fellers built a dam so thick, it washed out part of the trail. Caused me some strife on my last journey home. Eustace chuckled then, winding up for yet another joke. <laughs> you ought to enact some of that biblical retribution your God's so good at. Wading into the water just above the dam of sticks, willows, and mud that the beavers had built, Eustace bellowed out a deep woof, indicating that despite the early morning heat, the water still carried a chill. A few steps in, Eustace turned downstream, lifted his right leg, and began to kick a hole in the dam. The sporadically toothed smile that stretched across his face was infectious, and Jesse found himself smiling as the old man kicked in the beaver's hard work. As the water began to rush through the foot-sized hole in the dam, Eustace pulled the trap off from around his neck where he had been carrying it. He had deftly set the device and placed it just under the water, nestling it into the mud right beside the hole. Once set, Eustace kept hold of the chain attached to the foothold device and worked his way back to the creek bank and Jesse. You see, these little fellas hate when some mess with their dam. They can't stand the sound of rushing water. It makes them feel antsy. Guarantee one of them's going to come out and repair that hole tonight and hopefully step right in that trap. As Eustace took one of the chewed sticks from the dam to anchor his chain to the bank, he asked Jesse to put a little bit of the castorium oil on a stick and place it around the dam. I figured if the sound of water rushing don't draw him out, and a little bit of that magic stuff will bring him in. Jesse did as he was told and then found himself scrambling back up the steep embankment toward the waiting mules and horses, in an attempt to keep up with the old man. Come on now, Eustace hollered. We got nine more miles to get to the top of Bald Mountain and a whole lot more traps to set. Saddling up again, Jesse drew in a deep breath of the cool morning air and said a prayer to God. Prayer of thanks. Chapter 7 Bald Mountain Altoris County, Idaho July 1867 Eustace and Jesse had traveled nine miles up the ragged dirt road to the base of Bald Mountain, setting beaver and coyote traps along the way. The mountain looming over them got his name for a pretty obvious reason. 
looking up at the remaining thousand feet to the summit. An area of bare rock looked like it had just been clear-cut of any trees. The pair worked their way around its base and up into an area surrounded on three sides by rock formations. Bald Mountain and its impressive snow-covered peak behind them, and smaller ridgeline offshoots to their left and right. As they worked through the pines, they eventually popped out at a gorgeous alpine lake named after some fellow with the family name of Corbus. Guess that man you work for is ready to meet you, Jesse, Eustace said as the lake came into view. Jesse glanced in Eustace's direction, ready for another terrible joke. Because this is about as close to heaven as you can get. As Jesse took in their surroundings in the late evening summer light, he chuckled, as Eustace might have been right. This did feel like heaven. Jesse caught himself leaning over his saddle horn, looking at the reflection of Bald Mountain in the glacial deposit of crystalline water that was Corbus Lake. Flaring his nostrils several times, he took in deep breaths and closed his eyes as gratitude for that moment showered over him. He said another prayer of thanks to God, but before he could say amen, Eustace's voice cut through his brief moment of serenity. Come on now! Eustace scoffed as he led his horse and mule train toward the water. Apparently even heaven has work to be done. It wasn't long before the men had the horses and mule team unsaddled, hydrated at the lake, and cut loose to graze in the grassy bowl, where they would set up camp. Eustace went to start a fire near the shoreline that had two fallen trees that would make for a great resting spot, and offer some defensive advantages if anyone tried to get the drop on them in the middle of the night. Their spot only had one entrance, and if someone tried to sneak in, they would have the upper hand. Yet with hours of light left in the day, and only around ten miles left to get to Atlanta, Jesse didn't understand why they had stopped and not pushed through. Eustace, I appreciate your attempt to show me this land, why are we setting up camp with hours of sunlight left? Don't we have a short push to get to Atlanta? Sure do, but we sure as shit ain't finishing this journey in one day, Eustace answered. One thing you need to learn and learn quick is that these woods is crawling with all manners of evil. Most of it's come from that town down the hill. Bandits and fleeing yellow men run all up and down this road. I ain't planning on getting into any scrapes, save for the critters and my traps. As night began to fall and the sun slid out of view behind Bald Mountain, Jesse and Eustace leaned up against their respective logs to get some rest. With a fire crackling, Jesse started to ask questions about the town he was about to enter. Eustace was happy to answer when he could as he pulled out a small, partially completed figurine, which looked like the beginning of an owl, and took the whittling. That town was founded a few years back by a feller who went by the name of Stanley. He and his crew popped over this hill, prospecting, and eventually found some gold and silver placer mining along the river, Eustace said. Word got out there, there was a secret spot that held untold fortunes, and then every prospector from the west started trying to find the place. Snorting as he chuckled to himself, Eustace let his memories flood in as he continued to whittle away at the piece of wood in his hands. There must have been about a hundred folks trying to find his place a few years back. This mount we're sitting on in the surrounding hills made quick work of them. A few months from now, this lake is going to be froze over and buried under several feet of snow. And that snow don't ever seem to go away. Jesse took in this new information as he looked around in the waning evening light. As Eustace continued to regale him with stories, he noticed some movement in the wood line to his right. While still intently listening to Eustace, he watched as a majestic mule deer buck worked his way gracefully between the fir trees. Eustace noticed Jesse's distracted gaze and took the break as an opportunity to get up and waddle over to his bed roll and saddle, not too far from where the campfire crackled. Rummaging through one of his saddlebags, he dug and dug until a smile crept over his face and he pulled out a flask. Plopping himself back in his spot against the log, Eustace hastily unscrewed the cap and took a few long pulls. Knowing better than to offer any to Jesse, he sank further into the dirt with a visible sheen of relaxation taking over his old and hardened body. Listen, the people who make it over this hill usually don't come back, Eustace said with a serious tone. To survive here, you gotta be as hard as the nails they put in your Jesus' hands. He raised a flask to his lips and took another swig. 
And boy, do they got a crew of folks down there. The yellow men they brought in work hard in and out of the mines. They keep the town running. There's a couple old Irish brothers who run most of the town. Or at least wreak the most havoc. The O'Kaleys. There's a guy named Ezra Hot who does his best to play sheriff. And there's a German, Jacob Ulrich, who keeps the town boozed up with his brew. And you'll run into a Mr. Cumming who owns or funds most of the town and employs the O'Kaleys to do his dirty work. You'll want to talk to the pretty Miss Flora Jones about a room. She runs a hotel on behalf of Mr. Cumming. As Eustace went about rattling off all these names, the drink must have finally hit him. His head grew heavier and heavier, and eventually resigned its full weight against the log behind him. His speech slackened and soon became incomprehensible, and his loud snoring signaled the end of any further intel Jesse may get on the town nine miles below them. As darkness consumed the mountains, the fire cast flickering bits of light onto the lake. The snoring man beside him smelled of burning wood filling his sinuses, and a few whinnying horses and mules nearby. Jesse was transported back to his past. He had the same sensation now that he felt many times during the war. The calm, eerie night that precedes the inevitable violent clash that would come the next day. Yet, here there was no war. Following the same ritual that he had in wartime, Jesse got up and went to the woodline and stared deep into the dank darkness that lay before him. With the reverberating snores from Eustace's nostrils fading and the only occasional loud pop from the fire, he started a conversation with God. Lord, I don't know what you have planned for me. I promise I'll serve you, and I intend to keep that promise. I don't know if Atlanta will be my final stopping point. But I pray to you to give me a sign. Please, Lord, keep me safe and help me spread our word. With the silent prayer complete, Jesse relieved his bladder on a nearby tree and then drank a handful of water from the pristine lake. Settling back into a spot on the shoreline next to Eustace, Jesse let his mind wander back to his past before eventually dozing off under the clear sky. Chapter 8 Andersonville Prison Camp Southern Georgia, May 1864 Jesse awoke to the low moan of thousands of men crying out for help. This was his second month in the South Georgia summer heat, and the stench of the Union prisoners he was now guarding made his stomach turn every single morning. The camp had been hastily erected as the Union forces continued their advances through Atlanta, Georgia and down toward the coastal city of Savannah. This caused a large contingent of southern troops to focus on consolidating prisoners into one of the southernmost camps still accessible, Fort Sumter. Located just north of Albany, Georgia, near the town of Andersonville, it was nestled in a forest of pine trees. The makeshift camp fell under the leadership of Captain Henry Wurz, whom Jesse and his regiment now reported to. The camp was walled on all four sides and only covered a few square acres of red Georgia clay land. There were no structures for the prisoners to seek refuge from the hot sun, and a small creek running through the center was the only source of water and sanitation. This enclosure, more akin to a pigsty, was meant to hold a maximum of about 10,000 prisoners, yet as the war was winding down, it held a sea of over 30,000 men. At odd intervals along the high walls, the Confederate engineers had built towers for sharpshooters, who were ordered to kill any prisoner who crossed a small fence that stood five feet in from the outer wall. A job that was becoming harder for soldiers like Jesse to justify as each day more prisoners were stuffed into the overcrowded pen. By the time the summer heat was at its worst, the stench from the compound was nearly unbearable, as men defecated repeatedly into the small stream that cut the area in two. As the only source of drinking water, men would consume fecal matter as the drive for thirst became too great in the scorching sun. This propelled thousands of men into a painful cycle of dysentery, and dead or dying men were dragged out of the compound by the hundreds every day. Though these men were his enemies, watching them slowly starve to death below his guard tower caused Jesse to feel empathy for these poor souls. Every night from his post, he watched desperate men being reduced to animals. Gangs of men would jump and murder any lone soul who had food rations hidden away, 
and the cries of the dead and dying rang in Jesse's ears, louder than any battlefield crescendo of rifle and cannon fire. One particular night, Jesse sat guard and looked out into the camp. The usual sound of slow death hung in the air, but there was no other commotion to distract the ears. Slowly, Jesse keyed in on the grunts of one individual seated by one of the few trees that dotted the landscape not far from his post. The soldier was shirtless and facing away from Jesse. Had it been brighter out, Jesse could have counted each of the man's ribs with ease. As the grunts continued, Jesse could see his back rise and fall with what seemed like extreme labored breathing. This went on for hours. It gradually stopped as the sun began to rise over the camp, and curiosity got the better of Jesse. As the sun came up and the guards changed duty, he sought permission to go check on this prisoner. Begrudgingly, the stone-faced Captain Wurz relented, but asserted that if Jesse were to be jumped by prisoners, it was by his own doing. Opening the gate and making his way into the pen, Jesse looked back over his shoulder to ensure that his regimental brother was positioned well in the guard stand to provide cover fire if things went south. When Jesse crossed over the inner fence threshold, he quickly realized there were few threats to be had. Nothing but emaciated, half-alive faces stared back at him as he stepped over and threw the bodies. If hell is real, then I just stepped into the flames, Jesse thought as he trolled forward through the maze of ghosts. As he neared the tree that he had watched all night, he could see the man still sitting in the same deep squat pose that he had held the whole night. Walking around the left side of the tree, Jesse eventually worked around the trunk to catch a frontal glimpse of the prisoner. When he took the last step, the man's face came into view. God forgive us, were the only words Jesse could muster as he looked up at his friend in the guard tower, silently signaling that he was okay. Jesse, however, was far from okay. The man he had watched all night was dead. He was frozen in that low squat position, and his head hung slightly down and to the right. His jaw was open and exposed the few teeth he had left, as the ones with gold fillings were already burrowed out by his fellow inmates. His chest was sunken above his descended belly and exposed ribs. Down his pants and near his bare feet was drying diarrhea that had trickled down the paper-thin skin covering the bones of his legs. To his right was a lone metal spoon, broken in half. This man, or what was once a man, had been digging his way out. Below his frozen posture was a hole about one and a half feet deep. As best Jesse could tell, he had dug into the hard clay ground until his spoon broke, and then began digging with his hands. As Jesse got closer, he could see that he had dug so hard and furiously with his hands that he was missing bone all the way down to the second knuckle on most of his fingers. Pointless. For another three months, Jesse endured that duty, witnessing similar atrocities and the sociopathic nature of his leaders. Until the relentless pursuit by General Sherman and the Union Army forced Captain Henry Wurst to disperse the few remaining living prisoners to other camps, further south and shut at the gates of hell at Andersonville Prison forever. Chapter 9 Bald Mountain, Alturas County, Idaho, July 1867 Jesse woke up in a deep sweat, panting heavily, as the face of the soldier who had tried to dig for his freedom started to fade from his subconscious. Quickly, Jesse reoriented and recognized that he was far from that man-made South Georgia hell. He knew he was no longer dreaming, as his brain caught him up to where he actually was, the woods of the Northwest Territory. He then remembered that a few years had passed since that nightmare had unfolded. The sorrow of that last thought was cut violently short by the sound of Eustace taking in yet another long pull of air that reverberated his epiglottis in what was one of the loudest snores Jesse had heard all night. About midway through the snore, the sound was cut off, and Jesse's jovial accomplice shot awake. Quicker to orient himself in his post-sleep haze, Eustace shook his head three times before he yawned, farted, patted his belly, and rolled onto his left side to push himself up. 
Well, let's get to it then. He mumbled through another yawn that seemed to have caught him off guard. In the pre-dawn morning, the pair stifled what was left of their dying fire, fetched the mules, and saddled up their own horses. As Jesse threw the saddle over his horse, caught the underbelly cinch, and began to tighten it, he could feel the morning gas let out of his horse. That act always excited him, as he knew the day of adventuring was just beginning, and this day would see him enter the town where his brother had died, and where he may just build a church and a new life for himself. Reaching into his near-side saddlebag, he thumbed the leather cover of his most prized possession, the Bible, and stood quietly in prayer once again. Ending the prayer for protection and guidance on whatever the road ahead may hold, he hopped up into his saddle and got his horse off to a slow trot to catch up to Eustace and the mules, who were already hustling toward their destination, Camp Gulch. Chapter 10 Camp Gulch Alturas County, Idaho July, 1867 The path leading down towards Camp Gulch and eventually the Yuba River was steep and unforgiving. It was the first spot where place mining prospectors had found gold four years earlier, and was unlike the alpine forest they had left at Lake Corpus. Instead, the area consisted of a steep grade rock scree, with a few small patches of aspen trees and timber at some of the lower elevations. You see all them tree stumps? asked Eustace rhetorically. The Chinese clear cut damn near half this hillside and even more in Atlanta, he continued. Them stamp mills they hauled into this place last year is powered by steam engines. And to break up all the ore they keep pulling from the ground requires a shit ton of wood. Jesse's eyes didn't quite catch all the stumps in the distance. His gaze was fixed closely in front of him as his horse seemed uncertain of the terrain they traversed. The loose rock kept giving way under his hooves, and Jesse could feel the tension in his horse's body. Eustace halted the train briefly and pointed toward a pine-rich area about a mile away from the steep, rocking embankment they were on. I got me some foothold traps over there for Wolf, he said. We got some time, let's go check them. With that, Eustace and the pack mules made a hard right turn, and the whole crew, Jesse included, began to warily side hill through the rocks toward the pines below. The morning light was beginning to crest over the mountains in the east, and this time there were no peaks to shield them from its rays. The openness of the bare face they were on accentuated the sun's orange glow and Jesse was glad to be entering into the pines to help obscure the bright light. Eustace and Jesse stopped right at the tree line, which ran like a finger from the midpoint of the mountain they had just ascended, all the way down to the bottom where it met with the Yupa River. From their vantage point, Jesse could make out what looked like an abandoned campsite with a pretty well-worn trail heading east from it. Right down there is Camp Gulch, mostly a stopover place for travelers these days. Now come on, Jesse, let's go check them traps. Eustace had pulled his Hawkins rifle out of his handmade beaver leather sheath, and he walked with confidence into the pines. Jesse was close behind and took in their surroundings. As they walked through the maze of trees, Jesse could still see the opening of the exposed rock they had just come from, which elicited a weird feeling of contrast. Within a hundred yards of the tree line, Eustace slowed his pace. He knelt down then, signaling Jesse to come closer. You hear that? Jesse strained his ears to pick up on whatever sound Eustace was smiling about. It took a second, but Jesse did finally pick something up. Chains? Jesse asked. You're darn tootin' chains, Jesse, Eustace said with glee. Eustace used his rifle like a cane to get himself back on his feet, before assuredly walking toward the sound. When he and Jesse got within forty yards of the catch, the rattling of chains grew louder. Whatever was trapped could sense the duo closing in and the desire to break free overwhelmed the caught animal. When they got through the trees and into the opening where Eustace had set his trap, they were met with a hiss that sent chills down Jesse's spine. He had never heard anything, animal or human, make such a menacing noise. As his nerves calmed, thanks to Eustace's relaxed demeanor, he squinted his eyes to see what was hiding in the bushes at the end of the taut and fully extended chain beyond them. Ah, shit said Eustace. That ain't no wolf. Eustace took two more powerful strides forward before Jesse could see in the early morning shade the face sticking out from the bush just fifteen feet away. 
Staring back at them was the gnarled and contorted face of a large mountain lion. At that moment, the 150-pound feline was crouched as low to the ground as possible, and with another stride forward from Eustace, it once again let out a warning hiss. With its face crunched, teeth exposed, and ears pinned back, Eustace seemed unfazed. As Jesse stepped out from behind Eustace to get shoulder to shoulder with him, the large cat must have sensed more danger. It bolted from his hiding spot and bounded toward the men at a speed that Jesse's brain couldn't comprehend. The Ultra Predator let out an ear-piercing roar as it leapt through the air right at Jesse. Instinctively, Jesse fell to his backside and brought his arms up in defense as the cat's right paw swiped aggressively at the unarmed man. Expecting a mauling, Jesse lay there on the ground for a few seconds before opening his eyes to see Eustace standing over him, chuckling at his greenhorn partner. Ten foot chain, he said. Get up and dust off, we gotta cut this guy loose. Eustace started to walk back toward the horses and mules, offering no hand to help get Jesse off the ground. Still in a bit of shock, Jesse watched as the cat continued to snarl at him from five feet away, clearly intent on taking him out. Wait, what? Cut the cat loose? Jesse asked through heavy breathing as he scrambled to his feet to catch up with Eustace. Yeah, I might not look like it, but I'm a cat guy, he said. Got a soft spot in my heart for him, especially after one of them stalked and killed an old enemy of mine. I figure if they're willing to do my dirty work, then I ought to treat them kind myself. Else end up on the wrong end of those claws and teeth you just had a front row show to. He pulled the small handsaw from one of his mule packs and turned to re-enter the pines where the cat was waiting. We gotta find us a young sapling that has a long branch with a forked end. Should look like the uh, wishbone on a chicken. After splitting up for a bit, Eustace hollered back for Jesse. From Jesse's right side, Eustace shuffled near with a four-foot branch and toe that had a forked end. The main beam was about four inches thick, and each fork was around two inches thick. It seemed young and sturdy, like it wouldn't break under pressure. So what do we do with this stick? Jesse asked, already unknowing the answer. Well, we are going to pin that some bitch's head down, and then I'm going to take that trap off of its back paw. Eustace handed Jesse the stick, and then turned to walk back toward the cat, motioning for Jesse to follow him. Once they were near the trap site, Eustace coached Jesse in a low voice to walk slowly toward the feline, who was now cowering in defense near the bush when they first saw her. Each slow step forward provoked the cat to expose her teeth and hiss wildly. Jesse angled the stick in such a way that the forks would go on either side of the cat's neck, and with enough force, pin it to the ground. When Jesse was within a few feet of the cat, the world went silent. He was so focused that the only sound he could make out was that of his own heartbeat. Breathe, Jesse. His first attempt to get the prong around the cat's neck was unsuccessful. On entry, the cat swatted the device away with lightning speed that sent a surge of adrenaline through Jesse's body, dilating his eyes and drenching him in euphoria. One more time, nice and slow, Eustace instructed from behind him. With that encouragement, Jesse got the forks aligned on either side of the cat's neck while he and the beast made eye contact. For a moment, he felt one with the animal, and sensed that the cat might have understood he was there to help. But, as he drove the fork toward the ground with force, pinning the wild animal's neck to the ground, all hell broke loose. Jesse put all of his strength into pinning the animal down, but the writhing and contorting body of the large mountain lion almost proved too much. The sound of chains, hissing, and claws flailing through the air was overwhelming. Jesse was holding a stick, and Eustace yelled out for him to put the end of the stick up against his hip to use his full body weight against the cat. With that wedge in place, Jesse sunk his heels hard into the ground, and with the fight left in the line slowly started to subside. As a cat calmed down, so did the adrenaline coursing through Jesse's body. He was now starting to emerge from the tunnel vision he had found himself in, and could see Eustace in his periphery. Slowly, on hands and knees, he crawled toward the back foot and closed in the metal trap. With little fight, the cat waited patiently for the trap to release, before tucking its injured foot under its hind quarters. Yusuf stood up beside Jesse, grabbed his shoulder in the process, and instructed him to slowly start backing up. When the pressure from Jesse's hip released and the prong around the cat's neck loosened, both Jesse and Eustace were subconsciously ready to get mauled. Yet, 
the exhausted cat just lay there as the two men slowly backed up toward the wood line, where their horses and mules were waiting. Never taking their eyes off the mountain lion, it wasn't until they were about twenty feet away that they saw the cat slowly get up, turn around, and walk in the opposite direction of the men. Hooey! shouted Eustace with a toothless beaming smile. Ain't that one hell of a way to get the morning started. Better than coffee, I'd say. Jesse didn't say anything as he watched the jolly man with more than one screw loose hop up into his horse. Show us something, Jesse thought. Thanks for the help there, son. Let's get on down to Camp Gulch and get this wagon moving up and over the Montezuma Creek. We'll be descended down into Atlanta before noon. Chapter 11 Montezuma Creek, Atlanta, Idaho, July 1867 The journey from the abandoned site of Camp Gulch and up the ridges of Decker Creek eventually led to the headwaters of Montezuma. This final push towards the town of Atlanta saw no checking or setting of any more traps, and Eustace's demeanor shifted from that of a jovial mill carrier to a stone-faced mountain man, focused on survival above all else. As Jesse took note of the quiet resolve and focused nature of Eustace's new countenance, the mule train came to a dead stop in the pines near the top of Montezuma Creek. Unsure as to why they stopped, Jesse kicked his horse and started to make his way around the mules and up towards Eustace. As soon as his line of sight reached the large packs hanging off the mules, he saw what had initiated their stoppage. Hanging from a makeshift gallows constructed of a large branch nailed between two ponderosa pines, was the naked body of a man in his mid-twenties. It was hard to make out his exact age, as the hot summer sun had swelled his body, and the birds, ants, and other small predators had begun to pick away at his corpse. The man looked gaunt, emaciated. It reminded Jesse of the prisoners he once watched over at Andersonville. Pinned to the man's bare chest was a note. Thief, by Leonora Mining Company. These millwrights take justice into their own hands around here, Eustace said. Walter Frank runs the Eleonora mine. He's a man you're going to want to take a wide berth around. Eustace turned to steer his horse around the hanging corpse then, and as he did, his saddle caught the shoulder of the man on display and sent the body into a slow spin, exposing the man's backside, riddled with whip marks and torn flesh. As the wind shifted in the afternoon heat, it carried the smell of death directly into their faces. Jesse scrambled for the handkerchief in his saddlebag and covered his face in the style of a Mexican bandito. He kicked his horse and followed the train back into the pines. Why do you have to pick this place to die, brother? This was all Jesse could think to himself as he solemnly steered his horse away from the scene. It was a short ride from the hanging corpse, an alleged thief punished for stealing from his employer that Eustace once again stopped his train. Fearing that there was yet another dead man, Jesse cautiously steered his horse up to the front to meet with Eustace. This time, however, the view proved less macabre. From the perch at the top of the Montezuma Creek, Jesse could see the town below. Welcome to Atlanta, was all Eustace said. He kicked his horse and started down the steep hill along the shallow creek toward the town below. Chapter 12 Montezuma Creek Trail, Atlanta, Idaho, July 1867. Looking down into the town of Atlanta, Jesse found himself in awe. Despite the warnings he had received about the town, he could now understand why his brother came here. It was the most beautiful place he had ever seen. Below the pair lay the town, which was much more developed than Jesse had anticipated, and was nestled in a low valley that looked surprisingly flat given the tall and rocky mountain that seemed to surround the village on three sides. The mighty Boise River, full of trout, salmon, and gold, cut right through the heart of the town and flowed westward toward the settlement of Boise, that laid eighty miles away through dense wilderness. Jesse could make out cattle grazing in a far field at the base of the largest mountain in view, Greylock, not far from a large building that belched copious amounts of dense steam into the air. Noting the destination of Jesse's gaze, Eustace cut in to start orienting Jesse to the landmarks. That there's the last chance mine, he said. 
Those crazy some bitches packed in a whole steam engine last year to run their presses. They got tired of running their rasters, I guess. I tell you what, though, that engine sure needs a whole lot of wood, and they've been paying the Chinese to fall trees all day just to power the thing. Eustace pointed in the direction of an adjacent hill, then. Look at there, he continued. They done clear-cut all them trees, and ain't no signs of them stopping, neither. Ain't gonna be a single tree left in this town. As Jesse took in the view, he observed the hustle and bustle of the town's core once again. He noticed twelve or so buildings forming a clear grid, and one main road cutting through the center. Horses pulled a few wagons, and a number of people walked to and from various establishments. As his eyes worked outward from the epicenter, he regarded clapboard homes that had been hastily built when the first gold was found. Looking out further still, he saw loads of tents, not unlike the ones he had stayed in during the war, that looked like little off-white dots between the few remaining pines in the valley. From above, the forest looked deceased, perhaps a foreshadowing of the fate that awaited all trees in that area. Eustace let Jesse take it all in for a good five minutes before cutting through the silence. Yeah, you see that building over yonder? Eustace asked, pointing out a small whitewashed building in the dead center of town. That's the postal office, our final stop, and where we'll say our goodbyes. Eustace spurred his horse, and his mule train began to follow him down the last steep trail, into the belly of the wildest place in the west, Atlanta. As the dust kicked up around their train in the midday July heat, Jesse was filled with an odd excitement as they descended into the basin. In the short time he had been in the Idaho territories, the tales and lore of Atlanta had metastasized in his head, only to be bolstered by the death of his brother. Like many men, he had imagined something else, perhaps a hellscape like he had read about in the books of Matthew and Luke in the Bible. But instead, he saw mountains, clear streams, and abundance of game, gold, and fortune. Despite the heat, it felt more like heaven to Jesse. He knew the city held secrets, and as their train moved closer to the main thoroughfare of town, he caught his first sight of the people that made the town run. On the east side of the Montezuma Creek, about halfway down the 800-foot descent to Main Street, Eustace and Jesse stopped outside a clapboard building that served as an outpost for the Greenback Mine. Four men, shirtless and sweating, lined the small dirt path that they were traveling. Jesse tensed up as Eustace slowed to a halt. Out of there, Eustace! The lead man yelled out through a mustache so long that it curled over his bottom lip. Bringing us the goods, eh? Got any letters for me in there? Ah, oh, hell, Tom, Eustace replied. Ain't nobody riding to your crusty ass, especially no woman. The men chuckled and they parted to let Eustace and Jesse pass. As Eustace tipped his hat at the men, Tom locked eyes on Jesse, pulling up on the rear of the train. He was still wearing his handkerchief. Say, Eustace, what's this bandito you're dragging along with you? Just a preacher looking for a new flock, it seems. Eustace chuckled in his usual jovial manner. As Jesse and his horse passed, Tom looked Jesse dead in the eyes. A town full of wolves. And this guy wants to find some sheep, he said. As the men on the road exchanged glances and muted laughs at Tom's wit, Jesse kept his gaze forward. The road filled with dust once again as the mules shuffled ahead. Chapter 13 Main Street, Atlanta, Idaho, July of 1867 Passing the greenback mine led Eustace and Jesse down the dirt path until it dead-ended on a road that went either east or west. This is Main Street, hollered Eustace from the front of the train. As he veered his horse and mules to the left, westward, they were only a mile from the main arteries of town. No longer were they on steep terrain surrounding the city, but instead leveled out onto a flat and wide road, each side flanked with whole stacked rounds of wood drying in the summer sun. Say all this ponderosa wood, Eustace said. This is what I was telling you about. Them Chinese up in that basin are clear-cutting this whole area to power them steam engines and the stamp mills. Eustace pointed to a ridge littered with stumps and tents due west of town. Them Chinamen never stop. As the words made their way out of Eustace's mouth and into the realms of reality, the pair were struck by some commotion from behind. As if summoned from the ether, a young and handsome Chinese man on the Appalachia flew past the mule train without slowing down in the slightest. 
As soon as the dust cloud had cleared and the young man had passed them, they noticed a wagon moving up the road in the same direction, albeit more slowly than the young man on the horse. Eustace and Jesse moved their horses and mules as close to the ball of corded wood as possible to allow the wagon to pass. Four oxen drove the wagon under the direction of two petite and youthful Chinese men. As the wagon passed, the men made a conscious effort not to make eye contact with the two white men and held a solemn and forward gaze. As their group creeped by, Jesse could see that the wagon was dragging two large, freshly cut ponderous pines, kicking up an enormous amount of dust. As Jesse fumbled for a second handkerchief in his saddlebag, he caught a glimpse inside of the covered wagon. Though hard to see through the dust, Jesse made out two lifeless contorted forms lying on the wood clapboard bed. One of them looked as if he were missing his face. A third man lay on his back, writhing in pain and grabbing for his legs. His femur protruded through the skin of one leg in a terrible act of defiance. Jesse had seen that type of injury outside of the field tents, where the surgeons treated so many young men during the war. As the dust finally obscured the men, Jesse took a moment to close his eyes and say a prayer for the stranger. As the wagon crawled past them, Eustace piped up through the settling dust. I ain't a dull moment in this town, he said. I bet you they've taken them to the bone scraper. Bone scraper? Jesse asked. The Chinamen are run by a group called the Tongs. The Tongs run everything for the poor fellers, Eustace said. Food, pay, housing, jobs. Part of the deal is if you die, they'll take your corpse, chuck you in the ground for a few years, unbury you, and scrape off any remaining bits of flesh and let them bleach in the sun. Then they'd throw them in a box and send them back to China. Eustace paused and thought for a moment. Superstitious bunch, I tell you. Seems like a whole lot of work for a bunch of people who'd never know the difference, seeing as if they're already dead and all. As they made a final push into the downtown part of Atlanta, Jesse's head began to swim at the thought of such deep ritualistic ends that these people went through to honor their fellow men. Chapter 14 Main Street, Atlanta, Idaho, July of 1867 the bustle of people, horses, chickens, and hogs consumed the men and their train within a half mile of the post office. All around them, Chinamen, miners, and the scant few ladies in long dresses milled about. Many of them called out to Eustace, thanking him for making the long trek over the hill to bring them mail and other goodies. On the way in, they passed a working blacksmith, a shanty schoolhouse, the Golden Eagle Hotel, the Atlanta House Hotel, a small laundry facility, Fletcher's General Store, and the Chinese Apothecary, which obscured the bone-scraping parlor behind it. Jesse was impressed by the number of establishments in operation, and could see more beyond the whitewashed postal building. As they pulled up to the empty hitching post outside of the post office, they dismounted their horses and worked toward each other. Say, Jesse, why don't you help me unload these mules before we go our separate ways? Eustace asked. And for helping, I'll cover your board for tonight. Unable to pass up the offer, and with nowhere better to be at the moment, Jesse obliged. Together, the men offloaded the mules and moved Eustace's hall into the mostly empty postal building. As Eustace and Jesse stacked boxes of dynamite, mail, and other requested goods, the revolving door of the saloon-style building constantly churned. One by one, folks filed in, eager to see what Eustace had brought them. This made the unpacking surprisingly easy, for as soon as they offloaded anything from a saddlebag, it seemed to find its recipient before it ever hit the unswept floor. This also gave Jesse a chance to get acquainted with many of the people Eustace had regaled him about, and perhaps key town folk a moment to size up Jesse as the newest outsider. The O'Keeley brothers stopped by, six shooters strapped to their ragged trousers, looking for mail from back east. A beautiful woman who went by the name Dutcham came to see if her hand mirror had arrived, and Cole Lamb, the bone scraper and merchantile, inquired about his order of drugs. Walter Frank, the boss of the Lenora Mine, came in to pick up his dynamite. The rest of the town followed suit, hoping for handwritten letters from loved ones back east. With each one of those passerby came sideways glances and questions to Eustace as to who in the hell was with him. Yet no one paid too much mind to the new and handsome man, as they were all intent on finding a quiet place to consume whatever news lay in the off-white faded envelopes they had received. 
Well, I think that about does it for today, son. These folks made my job easy. Ain't no one to track down, Eustace said. Guess they was pining for some outside news. He patted his belly then. Let's say we head over to the Golden Eagle and get some more food, he continued. That'll get you set up with a room for tonight. As the pair left the empty sacks on the floor on the building and made their way back into the sunlight of Main Street, a noticeable calm had descended upon the town. Ah, mail day, said Eustace. I ain't gonna hear a peep for the next few hours. Folks catching up on the lives they left behind. My favorite time in this town. Too bad it don't last forever. With those words came the shrill cry of a young woman sitting on a barrel not far from the men. Clutching a letter to her chest, tears streaming down her cheeks in oversized globules, she set off at a full sprint toward what Jessie assumed was the direction of her home. Well, except for her, I guess. <laughs> yeah, Eustace said with a laugh. Slapping Jessie on the back, Eustace rubbed his belly one more time and let the pair pass their horses and mules and across the street to the Golden Eagle Hotel. Chapter 15 The Golden Eagle Hotel Atlanta, Idaho July of 1867 The Golden Eagle was a squat two-story building with guest rooms on the upper floor and a makeshift dining room downstairs. With the silence that loomed over town, Jesse and Eustace made their way up to the bar with ease, while patrons remained engrossed in weeks old newspapers and letters. Only the occasional scream of a half-lit patron hearing about some far-off political decision or event interrupted the silence. Behind the bar stood a woman, taller than most, with long blonde hair worn in braids. Her dress was covered in stains from the various food and drinks she served, and her collar had grown a distinct discoloration from the sweat that pooled around her neck in the summer heat. As Jessie and Eustace neared the bar top, Jessie watched the woman hide an envelope under some bottles. With the back of her hand, she dabbed away the tears that had built up in her hazel eyes. At the sight of the men, she turned her back in an effort to collect herself before turning around with a forced smile. What can I do with you and your handsome friend for you, sis? She said, a hint of a whimper in her voice. I'll take whatever the hell you're serving, Flora, said Eustace. Lucky for you, I've got rabbit today, and the stew's been sitting untouched on account of you bringing everyone news today, she said. The town's gone quiet. As she turned to go and fetch the food, Jesse caught an elbow in his side from Eustace and knew that whatever he was about to say would be good, given the slapstick, toothless smile that seemed to span the full length of his face. Hooey, Jesse! I know you's a religious man and all, but that woman right there makes a journey over the hill almost worth it, he said. Floor James. Mm -hmm. Eustace pulled back a bar stool to sit, rubbing his belly once again and dreaming of the food to come. Within minutes, the lovely woman made her way back with two bowls of piping hot rabbit stew and placed them in front of the men. Eustace barely gave her time to set it down before he dove in with his oversized spoon and began shoveling it into his gullet. Jesse, though, took more time before digging in. He studied Flora's movements and demeanor. He could sense sadness in the young woman, and wanted nothing more than to talk with her and understand her source of pain. But now wasn't the time. As Jesse's mind wandered, he felt the gentle hand of Flora on his shoulder. Enjoy the meal, she said, radiating a sense of warmth through Jesse's body on an already steamy day. Spitting through a mouthful of rabbit stew, Eustace stopped Flora before she left the bar to attend to other patrons. Say, Flora, I already got my regular room here at the Golden Eagle. You got any open rooms for my friend here? No, sir. We'll fill up. But we do have some rooms across the way at the Atlanta house, she replied. I'll tell you what, I'll walk your friend over after you two travelers get a belly full. Once again slapping Jesse on the back, this time with a wink, Eustace went back to his already close to empty bowl. Gobbling down the last bit of stew, Eustace let out a loud belt while Jesse and Flora exchanged a subtle glance, the kind of look that said, I'm sorry for my friend's behavior, though they both knew his actions were out of their control. As they wrapped up their meal, the sustenance and liquor visibly set in, and with a more than forceful side hug, Eustace pulled Jesse close and declared that he was about to retire up to his room. He would hit the trail to check his traps on the way back to Rocky Bar in the morning. Listen here. He said between hiccups, If you end up staying and building that church of yours, assuming it don't get struck by lightning, 
I best be seeing your I best be seeing your mail in the mix the next time I head back over that hill. With a half stumble that caused more imbalance than his usual limp, Eustace got up, tipped his hat to Jesse and Miss Flora, and in a stronger than expected French accent, he bid the pair La while enacting a half curtsy. Tickled with his own formality and excellence in another language, Eustace made his way toward the stairs. I've been here two years and ain't met a normal man yet, said Flora with deadpan tone as they watched Eustace stumble up the steps. Since my husband left on a hunting trip a year ago and never came back, I keep thinking some tall, handsome suitor might walk through those doors and sweep me off my tired feet. With a wink, she turned to Jesse. Guess I gotta pray hard, huh, preacher man? With that, she grabbed Jesse by the forearm and led him across the street to the Atlanta Hotel. As they left the empty bowls behind, she told Jesse about the proprietor of the establishment, an older gentleman by the name of Earl Cumming. She joked that Mr. Cumming barely made it here as he was already ancient when the city was established three years back. He had made his money back east, and had been living in a comfortable life there until one day, his youthful spirit took over and he left his hag of a wife and set out toward the Rockies. Eventually, he landed in Atlanta and acted as a sponsor to many of the budding mining operations, she told Jesse. Most folks pretended to love Mr. Cumming, but he surely wasn't a man you wanted to be in debt to, which most of the town was. Over time, he started to build a network of enforcers to help him recoup debts. The O'Keeley brothers, most of all. Two unscrupulous Irishmen who landed here after the war and weren't quite cut out for mining. Lucky for Mr. Cumming, they had no qualms about doing his dirty work and playing debt collector. For their efforts, they stayed fed and had power as a cult of fear spread amongst a small village wherever they were nearby. As Flora led Jesse into the Atlanta Hotel, he took in the ornate decor and wallpaper. Huge, taxidermied figures of full-sized bears, elk, and mountain lions stared back at him as he followed on Flora's heels toward the main desk, where a very old man with surprisingly thick gray hair sat waiting. Florida introduced Jesse as the man who came over with Eustace, and said he was looking to utilize one of the spare rooms. Before she could finish the introduction, Mr. Cumming lifted a finger and bent down behind the counter. As he resurfaced, old Mr. Cumming pulled out a comically large ear trumpet, rested it on the desktop, and leaned his ear up to it. Flora turned to Jesse. This old coot had bad hearing before he got here and started playing with dynamite in the mines, she said. Now we can't hear Jack. Smiling from ear to ear, Flora more loudly stated the request for Jesse's room into the large end of the ear trumpet. But once again, cutting her off with nearly a yell, Mr. Cumming tapped the table and began to speak. Ah, oh, yes, I sure do have an open room. How long will you be staying? Well, hopefully just a few nights, Jesse replied. I am hoping to find my brother's grave, pay my respects, and talk with God as to whether this is a place I want to settle. A religious man, are you? We could use a few more of your kind in this valley, Mr. Cumming said loudly. We mostly get criminals and murderers seeking a quick PD. Well, I've been searching for a place to plant my roots and maybe build a church, Jesse continued. But right now, I am just following the path that God lays out in front of me. Ah, oh, hell, son, you're at the end of the road now. I ain't no religious man. But if you're on a path, then this is where it ends. As Mr. Cumming finished his thought, the party was interrupted by three men making their way into the lobby of the hotel. Two men of nearly identical appearance, well-built and surprisingly handsome, stood on either side of a small-framed Asian man wearing a long coat, wrinkles, and a snow-white handlebar mustache, concealed under a wide-brim hat. Mr. Lamb, how nice of you to stop by for a visit this afternoon, rejoiced Mr. Cumming. Co Lamb had been in Atlanta since it was founded, after leaving a past job on the Union Pacific Railroad. He dragged his wife and 12-year-old daughter up and over the steep terrain, and vowed to never move again once he was settled. As it turned out, Co was quite the businessman amongst the Chinese labor force that was beginning to swell. With the help of one of Mr. Cummings' friendly loans with lopsided terms, Co was able to run the bone-scraping operations for the Tongs, open a small medicinal apothecary, and help establish a gambling and opium house. By all accounts, Ko was the epitome of Chinese-American success, but at his presence in the hotel indicated, his success came at a cost. With a solemn look, 
Ko opened his breast pocket and pulled out a stack of cash that was quickly snatched up by one of the two O'Keeley brothers slanking his side. They handed over the cash to Mr. Cummings, who counted out each bill to his greedy satisfaction. Once each bill was accounted for, he waved his hand like a southern debutante, and the O'Keeley brothers turned Ko around and escorted him back to the door without uttering a word. You see, I don't know where you own money to the coolies, said Mr. Cumming, loud enough for Ko to hear. But that little yeller feller is different, trustworthy. He always pays on time, even if it is little more than what I charge a white man. Plus, he's filling up graves all the time, so I figure I should stay on his good side. Laughing to himself, Mr. Cumming bent down and started fumbling through a drawer right below him. After some loud rustling, his hand reemerged with a large key. Here you go, mister. Miss Flora will show you up to your room. Stay as long as you please. As Flora and Jesse turned to make their way down the hall toward the guest rooms, Mr. Cumming tapped on the table with a penknife to regain their attention. If you talk to your boss man and decide this is where you'll sow your oats, you just let me know, he said. I've been wanting to invest in some more, who do you say, philanthropic causes. Seems to me a church may just be the way to do that. In a voice hushed enough to elude the ear trumpet, Flora retorted, Ain't no amount of money buying that man into heaven. If you can, I sure as hell don't want to go. This brought a modest smile to Jesse's face as he followed Flora down an unfamiliar hallway. Maybe these are all the signs I have been asking for, he thought. Chapter 16 Bone Scraping Parlor Atlanta, Idaho July 1867 After a good night's rest, Jesse woke up with one thing on his mind, finding his brother's grave. He emerged from his room and made his way back into the now-empty lobby, where Mr. Cumming had greeted him the night before. Once in the lobby, Jesse could feel the cool morning air pouring in through the door that had been left open overnight. Pulling the door open wider, Jesse stepped out onto the front patio and took in the deep yellow and blue colors of the summer sky. As the sun crept over the mountains to the towns east of Atlanta, the same ones he and Eustace had traversed just a day earlier. The hustle and bustle of Main Street was more sparse compared to when they had first arrived, but still had more activity at 6 a.m. than there had been after all of Eustace's postal mail had been handed out. There were a few men on horseback who seemed to be heading out of town, a few children walking around the schoolhouse, and some stray chickens, cats, and birds singing at the first light of day. Breathing in deeply, Jesse decided to walk Main Street further west to see what buildings, people, and interests lay in that direction. His intent was to get a better lay of the land and hopefully find someone who could help shed light on his brother's death and burial. As he began to walk, he could see smoke rising from small campfires on the far clear-cut hill covered with the tents of Chinese labor workers aptly named China Basin. Those folks were up and stirring, and the hill looked much like an active anthill with men scurrying in all directions. Jesse shifted his attention from the far hill to a building just to his left, not far past the postal office he had worked in the day before. A rudimentary sign that read Brewery hung from the building's second story, and as the door swung open with an audible whoosh, two men emerged, half stumbling out into the morning light, instinctively raising their hands to block the sun that now beamed into their dilated eyes. The men began to curse and stumble toward Jesse, and presumably their homes. Aye, what in the fuck? Who in the fuck are you? said one of the men in a drawn-out and over-exaggerated drunken tone. Wanting to avoid any conflict this early into his stay, Jesse remained quiet with the same stone-faced expression he had carried for years. I were talking to you, the other man slurred. What's with the fancy clothes? He stumbled to his side then, grabbing onto his friend for support. Say, why don't you give me that jacket of yours? Jesse did as he always had in this type of situation. He kept his body calm, locked his eyes on the hips of his potential accosters to predict their movements, and refrained from speaking or engaging. He was primed to fight if he had to, but his countenance did not give that away. To these drunkards and to most that he encountered, he exuded a somewhat feeble aura that betrayed his own true nature, a nature that he had become intimate with during the war, and had sworn off in favor of serving the Lord. As Jesse's silence teased the two men, they became more irate, and as they began to close the distance toward Jesse, one of them brandished his six-shooter that had been on his hip the whole night. 
Jesse's heart rate quickened a bit, but he remained still. As the barrel of the gun bounced around in the air trying to find its mark, Jesse remained focused on the men's hips. He played out what he would do when the drunk man's hand steadied, and the pistol posed a real threat. But before any of that could happen, the drunk man let out a hissing scream and dropped his gun. I what in the shit! The gun-bearing drunkard cried as he bent over, grabbing his wrist in pain. Tom, Tristan, get out of here now! Go home! Calm land had emerged from his nearby store, clutching a broom handle. Holding his wrist, Tristan bent down to retrieve his pistol from the ground, looked up at Jesse through bloodshot eyes, and turned toward his friend. The pair embraced each other in a sideways manner, as if they were running a three-legged race, and began to hobble east down Main Street. As they sauntered off in a crooked line, the accoster yelled out over his shoulder, I anyway, was just playing, you know. They have some drinks and they cause trouble. Most I can scare away, but some cause problems, Colam said. I am making tea. Would you come in? He said, motioning for Jesse to follow him back to his store. Jesse was a bit surprised at the accuracy with which Co spoke English, although his accent was quite thick. He followed the short man and his broom into the front entrance of his apothecary business. Walking into the shop allowed Jesse to drop his defenses, and he again returned to a normal baseline of adrenaline. Co's shop had two shelves, lined with dark-colored bottles and running the entire length of the nearly square building. Looking closely, Jesse could see handwritten labels on most of the bottles. Your friend Eustace keeps us stocked on the essentials, Co said. I practice medicine in China. With the rate of injury we have out here, it becomes a bit of a commodity. Jesse's eyes panned around the store before coming back to Co and speaking for the first time since he woke up. Sure does seem like quite a town here, he said. Lots of need for this type of medicine, huh? Oh, yes, lots of death and injury here. When I heard you might build a church, I was very happy, Co said as he reached for the loose-leaf tea on the shelf to his right. As he dipped the leaves into a vat of hot water he had prepared earlier, he pulled out a stool and took a seat. Me? I am a Taoist. He continued. My family believes we should live connected and in unison with nature. Most of the people in this town believe in nothing but their pistols. I think religion could be good for these bandits and hooligans. Not giving Jesse time to opine on his thoughts of whether he would or would not open a church in the town, Co shoved the small glass of herbal tea into his hand and waved at Jesse to follow him into the joining room. As they passed through what was clearly his family's meager living quarters, Jesse caught a glimpse of a teenage girl sitting on the lone single bed, engrossed in a book. This is my daughter Lynn, Co said. She is fifteen years old and has been with us through all of our travels. The introduction caught Jesse off guard, and he found himself standing motionless, staring at the lovely young woman for a long moment. As the two locked eyes, his mind wandered back in time. He thought of his wife. He thought of the unborn child he never got to meet. Would the child have been a girl? Would she have grown into a young woman like Lynn? Ever since the accident, he often daydreamed about what he or she would have looked like. He imagined the beautiful life he could have lived on earth with his beloved wife and child, had God not called him home. Standing there looking at Ko's daughter, he couldn't help but realize that if he had a daughter, she would be close to Lynn's age by now. Once Lynn turned back to her book, Jesse regained his bearings and continued to follow Ko through the room and out the back door. After all these years, I miss my life and child more than ever, is all he could think. Coming out into the morning sun once again, Jesse caught a glimpse of another building, a smaller one immediately behind the apothecary. At first he thought the building was whitewashed, but after a slight wind blew the steam from his hot tea out of his face, he realized he had been mistaken. Sat close to five feet high on all sides of the building were bones and neat piles. Jesse hadn't witnessed such a macabre scene since the war, where he had often seen stacks of bodies exposed to the elements for weeks before their discovery. Though taken aback, it occurred to him that this must be the building Eustace had told him about, where the bones of dead Chinese workers were scraped and then prepared to be sent back to the mainland. Never breaking his stride, Ko walked right into the building, which had no door. He sat on one of the two stools in the nearly empty room, put down his tea, 
I picked up a bone with bits of flesh still clinging to parts of the yellow calcium. Picking up a knife and beginning to scrape, he gestured with the bone for Jesse to join him. As Jesse sat down, Ko handed him a putrid bone and curved knife. Jesse willingly followed Ko's silent guidance and began to scrape away the bits of meat. The best that I can tell, you have no job. And to be frank, you don't look like you're cut out for mining. Never looking up from the bone in his hand, Ko continued. Lucky for you, I need help, and I can pay you. You can work until your church is ready. Thank you, Ko, Jesse replied, swelling with gratitude. But I'm not even sure I'll stick around. I'm waiting for a sign from God, and this is even the main reason I'm here. You're a preacher, and you made it all the way to the end of the road. What else is there to do? Stricken by the reality of Ko's words, Jesse thought for a moment before replying. I came here to find my elven youngest brother, Erwin, he said then. At the end of the war, he sent me a letter saying he had gone to Rocky Bar to find gold. He said I should join him, but when I got there, the peg-legged lady told me he had gone over the hill to Atlanta and got killed over a card game. I came to find him and pay respects to my last family member. Oh, my condolences, Ko said. But maybe that's your sign. Your brother died in my gambling house. Jim O'Keeley killed him. Ko scraped away at the bone he held in his hand. Jim said Irwin cheated, he continued. Irwin laughed and shrugged, and Jim shot him in his chest many times. Jesse's cool demeanor turned stone cold as he had listened to the account of his brother's murder. And although it seemed Ko could sense his soul and rage building, he continued to explain what had happened. Jesse, your brother had no money, and much like you, he was alone, Ko said. Nobody claimed his body, so Sheriff Ezra Hot left him at my door. I didn't know who he was. My team took him to our burial ground and I dug him a grave near our Chinese plots. I laid him to rest with some words in a small cross. I am sorry, Jesse. I can take you to him. Thank you, Jesse said, his throat dry, despite the tea he continued to sip. It was all he could think to say. The men sat in silence for some time, while Jesse meditated over the recounting of his brother's death until a sudden, searing actualization of pain brought him back to Earth. God! Jesse yelped as he dropped the bone to the ground. Submerged in thought, he had lost connection to the long strokes he was making with the razor-sharp blade, and had nicked the top of his left thumb, sending a trickle of blood onto the off-white bone that now lay at his feet. As Jesse watched the dripping blood, he felt a deep desire to avenge his brother's death, something he had sworn to the Lord he would avoid at all costs for sparing him during the war. I promised God I would never kill another man so long as I lived. These men are not innocent. After Ko rummaged through his medicine cabinet for bandages to wrap up Jesse's finger, the duo loaded into the lamb's ox cart and took off westward toward China Basin. As the slow-moving cart meandered past stacks of corded wood, Ko pointed out different operations around the town. Less than a mile from Main Street was a greenback mill which seemed to be running at full bore with dozens of men milling about doing odd jobs in the early morning heat. As they passed by Slippery Gulch, Ko pointed out a bevy of lean-to shacks where the prostitutes dealt in their trade for the tired and smelly men. As they passed the Red Light District, the only thing between them and the barren hill covered with tents and Asian men were oddly spaced circles of river rock, with the center post sticking out of the middle of each. Those are our rustros, Ko said. That's what the miners use to break up the rock if they don't have a steam-powered mill. They tie a mule to that center beam, and then attach heavy rocks to it, and they'll drive their mule in circles. Eventually, the rock is busted up enough for them to use mercury to separate out the gold flakes. Back-breaking work for the mules, at least. As the ox cart crossed the low point in the Boys River and made its way onto the opposite bank, Ko's demeanor changed. It seemed as though by crossing that river he was now back in China, an air of belonging and safety emanated from his Taoist core, and as their cart made its way into the tent line, 
seemingly hundreds of Chinese men started to emerge as a Greek co. The Chinese language gave no feeling of familiarity to Jesse, and although the men greeted Ko with a smile, the facial expressions of each man turned to a look of judgment as they made eye contact with the white man sitting beside Ko. Jesse could feel the eyes burning a hole in the back of his head as they rolled through the tent city that reminded him of his military days. From the last tent, it was but a three-mile journey to the mass grave the Chinese used for their short tenures under the earth. The scent of death worked its way through the pines and deep into the olfactory glands of Jesse's nose, triggering a flood of memories into his mind's eye of the death and carnage he had been so intimate with for so many years. As their cart neared the grave, they were greeted by a large-framed Asian man holding a surprisingly nice lever-action rifle. Wolves, Ko said, indicating that the man standing guard was there to protect the dead from being dug up by the area's main predator. Once the cart came to a stop, Ko disembarked with a remarkable agility for his age, and walked a mere thirty feet to a small protrusion in the ground that held the shape and dimensions of a medium-built man. At the north end of the protrusion, closest to the rocky face of Mount Greylock, stood a tilted cross. The only one in the whole gravesite. Jesse, this is where your brother, Urban, lies. I'll give you a moment. Jesse stared long and hard at this ground before bending on one knee to straighten across to a more upright position. I'm sorry I wasn't here, brother. I'm not sure I could have protected you, but I could have been here when you died. For that, I am sorry. But I do know that you are with our mother, our brothers, and my wife and child. I know I will be there soon, too. But until then, I need to fulfill the promise I made to God. You picked an amazing spot to bring me to. It sure is beautiful here. Looking up from the grave at the 10,000-foot peak in front of him, Jesse shed no tears, though his heart was broken. As he sat in despondence, he caught a glimpse of movement in the pines to his right, which steadied his gaze. After focusing hard, he was able to make out a canine form stalking 100 yards away. Moving through the trees into a small opening was a beautiful gray wolf staring back at him with the same hollow and focused eyes that Jesse now possessed. The sun, he thought. The sacred moment came to an abrupt end there as a stout Asian guardsman wielding a 4570 rifle, emitting a thunderous crack that sent the wolf darting off into the woods, unwounded but frightened by the sound. Looking back over his shoulder, while still holding his brother's cross, Jesse yelled out to Ko, You still offering me that job? Thank you for listening to this episode of Stagecoach, brought to you by Dusty Saddles Publishing, the home of Western excellence, where the best of the Western authors can be found. Visit our website at dspublishingnetwork.com. Please join us for our next episode as we continue with the adventures of Jesse Waite in The Bone Scraper by Zachary Craig Hansen. <laughs>